Thank you all. Uh, we want to thank Amgen very much for sponsoring this panel. Uh, uh, we at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, now joined by the Bipartisan Policy Center, have for a number of uh, election cycles worked with NDI on panels on how the candidates would govern, trying to change the focus a little bit more away from the horse race itself and into the more significant questions uh, which voters ought to know about and everybody else as well, uh, whichever one wins, what the climate would be like and what characteristics the candidates bring from their pr past experience to bear uh, on uh, how they would actually govern if elected as, uh, as uh, president. Uh, John? Thank you, Norm. BPC is, is thrilled to be sponsoring this with NDI and AEI. Uh, Americans always like to make football analogies. You see that Norm and I are kind of like the wide receivers on this panel, and we've got a very burly offensive line in the middle. <laughs> burly certainly in substance, um, if not physical prowess. Uh, I'm going to introduce first, starting on my left, uh, uh, Senator Tom Daschle, who was um, represented South Dakota in the Senate for many years, as well as being majority and minority leader of the Senate. Uh, is today an advisor at DLA Piper, as well as one of the founders of our organization, the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, Scott Lehigh is a columnist and editor at the Boston Globe and has covered Massachusetts politics and Mitt Romney for, for a very long time. Uh, John Podesta uh, was served a number of positions in the Clinton White House, including chief of staff in the second term uh, and is the founder of the Center for American Progress. Uh, Ryan Lizza is a columnist and, and writer for The New Yorker, uh, has written extensively on second terms, on Paul Ryan, on almost every issue relevant to today's campaign. And Ben Weber is uh, at Clark and Weinstock, uh, served in uh, Congress representing Minnesota for many years, uh, and is very close confidant of, of many Republicans in Washington. So I'm going to turn it back to Norm for the first set of questions, and we'll start from there. Uh, thanks, John. It's great, uh, let me say, uh, on behalf of all of us to be here in Charlotte. Uh, the weather is uh, humid, but not quite what it was in Tampa. And of course, the <laughs> Uh, the hurricane actually uh, forced uh, Donald Trump to cancel out. Uh, nobody ever talks about the good things that can happen with, uh, with hurricanes. <laughs> actually, Ben, my favorite moment came when uh, they, uh, uh, one of the reporters approached Herman Cain and asked him uh, if he remembered Katrina. And he said, I never met her. I've had nothing to do with it. <laughs> They didn't yeah. prove anything. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's right. Nothing's been proven. Uh, we're going to talk both about uh, Governor Romney uh, and uh, President Obama in a second term. Uh, and let me start with Scott Lehi, uh, who has watched Mitt Romney for a long time, and including through his time as governor. Now, Romney dealt with a legislature that was about 85% Democratic. But talk a bit, Scott, about what we can learn from Romney as governor in dealing with that legislature, both the human interactions and the political style and tactics that he used that might help us understand a little bit how he would do with Congress. Well, I'd like to tell a story about Mitt uh, and a senator from South Boston, that I, a Democratic senator from South Boston, which is very much a, 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 an ethnic Irish um, Boston, you know, old, old neighborhood. And I asked this guy about maybe a year and a half into Mitt's term, I said, Jack, how is, uh, how's Mitt doing? And he said, well, I think he's doing pretty well, but boy, you can tell he's uncomfortable around people like me. And that was the feeling uh, with Mitt and the Democrats in the legislature, that he didn't really want to engage. Another, another state senator said he just doesn't want to get any state house dust on him because that'll, that will maybe hurt him when he, when he goes national. Um, so in general, what Romney did was he had a, a very a good cabinet, clean government, very little patronage, would not do any of the horse trading that you kind of need to get things done, um, and, but would propose things and then let them lie and very little would happen with them. Uh, the, the legislature would kind of shrug its shoulders and, and he, wouldn't, he wouldn't build much of a public case and certainly wouldn't get inside and, and do the kind of lobbying with the legislature that you need to do. Now, the, the, one, the one exception that kind of proves the rule and, and his, his signal success in Massachusetts, of course, is Romney Care, where he really saw something that I believe, he, you can't find the exact language, but he did think this would be a, a national model. And I think before it was adopted by the, by the uh, Obama administration, he did believe that this could become a Republican alternative. And he was very invested in getting it done. Worked very hard with, particularly with the Senate president, did a lot of, a lot of talking, a lot of bringing people in. 
and really was a driving force in that. And, and, but th that was so different than the other things he had done while governor that it, it really was a surprise. And it's been now, of course, he, he is largely disavowed it. And as I say, it really is his, his uh, signal achievement as governor. Just uh, for a second, uh, the Republicans in the legislature in Massachusetts were, you know, trace elements in many ways. Did they have a different reaction? Was he more comfortable dealing with them? You know, somewhat more comfortable, but I think there was, A, a they're, they're largely irrelevant. Um, because they just are not, are not enough of them that they make a difference. But they sometimes felt that they were sort of a remnant of our last governor, which is to say, or, or our, they're really the, the, the important Republican governor. We have Bill Weld, who was much more moderate on social issues. And as Mitt began to evolve rightward uh, in, in preparation for his presidential run, the, the more Weldian types, kind of the social liberals or libertarians in, in the legislature, resented a little bit and didn't want to be sort of pulled into a position of supporting him uh, on issues where they were more, you know, they were really more kind of government out of, the, out of, out of people's bedrooms and, and, you know, out of their health care decisions. Ben, uh, let me turn to you. Having served in Congress for a long time and been around uh, Washington, and having lived through at the center of uh, the Gingrich Revolution and all the changes that took place as we evolved from 40 years of Democratic uh, hegemony uh, into a Republican uh, majority. And now, through the years since, a very different Congress than the one uh, in which you sat. Uh, reflect for a, a few minutes on a President Romney dealing with this group of Republicans in <laughs> Congress. Well, uh, first of all, let me say it's a pleasure to be here. I knew if I didn't come, you would conduct a conversation with an empty chair, so I <laughs> thought I'd better make it. <laughs> Don't, I know it sounds bizarre, but anyway. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but I'm pleased to be here. <laughs> uh, and always pleased to be with NDI, which is one of the really great organizations in this country. Um, I think, you know, if, if Romney's biggest problem was dealing with the Democrats in the Massachusetts legislature, a President Romney would have a big problem dealing with conservative Republicans, particularly in the House of Representatives. Uh, it's interesting to me that we talk about the, the uh, increased partisanship in this country. I think we're somehow using the wrong term because the parties themselves have actually less clout as organizations, whether it's the National Republican Party, National Democratic Party, or the caucuses of the two parties than they have in the past. They're increasingly driven by their members who are driven by ideological interest groups to a substantial extent. Uh, I believe that that is true on, in the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party. It's more evident because we have a Democratic president that the Republicans can cheerfully oppose. I think if the shoe were on the other foot, you'd find the ideological uh, dynamics within the Democratic Party pretty apparent too. But if, if Romney wins and has to deal with the Republican Congress, he's going to have a difficult time assembling a majority, particularly in the House, uh, that, comp that can compromise enough to get something through the Senate. Uh, I think he can do that. I think I, I was really interested in hearing the comments about his tenure as governor, but uh, I think that Romney will be pretty hands-on when it comes to policy. One of the things I have always liked about him is, is that he really drills down and learns the issues himself. I, I was uh, his policy director four years ago. I was much more involved in that campaign. And we started talking about health care and things like that. I was amazed. He had to know more about that health care program than anybody in the legislature or than any of his own staff. And that's a good place for a president to start who has to deal with a Congress that may be somewhat difficult. Can I follow up, Ben, just uh, do you think Romney's going to deal more with leaders like John Boehner and let John Boehner try to keep his, the speaker, uh, keep his troops in line? Or is he really going to be reaching out more to the rank and file, to Tea Party Republicans? I think that he'll do a lot of, uh, of reaching out. I mean, the, I, the, the leadership, that, but let me clarify what I said. I didn't mean to imply we've got weak leaders, frankly, in either party. I think that they have a more difficult time than leaders have in the past, but I think McConnell and Boehner are, are good leaders given the circumstances that they're dealing with, and I think that they'll deal quite well with, uh, with a Governor Romney, but there's a, uh, or a President Romney, but there's a, a, a big ideological agenda uh, in our party, and the Congress is not likely to simply turn that over to a new president, even if that new president is a Republican. Ben, let me uh, uh, follow up on that a little bit more, and then I want to turn to Ryan uh, uh, as well. I heard Paul Ryan uh, a number of times, uh, long before he was chosen as a running mate, talking about the strategy that would be employed if Romney wins and the Republicans win both chambers. 
and it is, and he was presumably working on it months ago to put together uh, what he called the mother of all reconciliation bills, uh, that they were going to hit the ground running with a dramatic program to implement as much of a quite revolutionary agenda as they could, and they'd push the envelope here. Um, and they'd do it from day one. They'd start on January 3rd. They'd have it ready for him to sign, presumably, assuming they could get 50 votes in the Senate, uh, on January 20th. Is, does the Romney campaign appreciate that? And does it appreciate <laughs> that if they want to change uh, an agenda that's not going to be necessarily the one that he deep down might want, uh, that they're going to have to start working on that long before uh, probably the election, but certainly long before the inaugural? Romney campaign has been very careful not to get into too much of legislative politics. Very careful. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's discussions and planning going on both about what you just described, Norm, and in my judgment, also equally or maybe more important, how to confront the lame duck session, which, which will be in session just before we reach the fiscal cliff. In my judgment, that's a harder question even than the one you talked about. But certainly, if Republicans want to implement an agenda, uh, the, the, the avenue you talked about is about the only one really available to them in a polarized Congress. The only thing I would add to that it is the real decision on that is ultimately going to be made by Mitch McConnell and the Senate leadership. And I don't know how uh, aggressively they will want to use the reconciliation process. Senators of both parties, when they've come up against the possibility of fundamentally undermining the filibuster in a serious way have usually backed off from that. It, it's certainly not going to be my call. My point is I don't think it's necessarily going to be a new administration's call either. Ryan, you, you wrote uh, the definitive uh, profile of Paul Ryan uh, in a prescient way, really, before he emerged uh, nearly this much on the national stage. You spent quite a bit of time with him. Uh, reflect on this question a little bit, but also what role do you think uh, a Paul Ryan would play in a Romney administration as a liaison both to the larger conservative community, because clearly he has a cachet that Romney has not had, but also with his, uh, what would soon be, would soon be former colleagues in uh, Congress. And does he have the ability to move them if he is now representing uh, the Romney administration and not his previous viewpoints? Yeah, and the, I guess the question is, what, what was Romney thinking when he picked Paul Ryan? I mean, you know, what, not, I don't mean that in a sarcastic way. I, I mean, was he thinking that, <laughs> look, you know, Ryan's, as, as Romney's pointed out, and as I wrote about and everyone who's written about Ryan has pointed out, he's been the intellectual leader of the Republican Party over the last few years. He basically took a set of ideas that in 2008 he could only get eight co-sponsors for, um, modified them a bit, and by 2011 with the new Republican House, um, pass them with, uh, with only four Republicans voting against them. That's a remarkable achievement for one guy. And so Mitt Romney, who does, you know, so now we have a Republican Party that, as you were pointing out, is very much led uh, by its congressional wing. You know, it's sort of an interesting dynamic. You, 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 in, in, I think in a Romney presidency, right. a lot of Republicans believe that the you know, the, the locus of ideas is going to be coming out of the House of Representatives because, frankly, Mitt Romney has been all over the place when it comes to policy. And so when Romney was sitting down to choose a running mate, at first I thought, wow, this is Mitt Romney embracing that congressional wing, embracing Paul Ryan. He has come out on the side of the most conservative faction within his party. He sort of put an exclamation point on all the trends that have been happening in the Republican Party. But I suppose you could make the opposite case, that he was actually just buying insurance, right? That he needed someone in his government that could both be a liaison to, you know, Cantor and the, the powerful conservatives in the House, and who can tame, you know, what I think is going to be the beast of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Republicans in the House if, uh, if, if, if Romney wins and they control uh, government. So I, I don't think, I would be interested to just, you know, see what other people think about that. Is it, is it, Mitt in embracing the most conservative faction, or is it him buying insurance uh, uh, if, he, if he actually wins? Let me follow up with one more, and then we'll turn uh, and pivot a little bit more to an Obama uh, second term. Uh, you know, when the class of 2010 came in, the Tea Party group, uh, at that point, Paul Ryan was an icon to them. He really was the leader on the budget. But they all ran uh, on a pledge that they were immediately going to cut $100 billion from the budget. And uh, as soon as they got there, 
um, it became clear that that wasn't going to happen. And it was Paul Ryan who had to give them the message that, oh, we hadn't realized that we're actually in the middle of the fiscal year, and so it's only half a year, so that means 50 billion. And then we got a few technical issues, so we can only do 36. And they hooted him out of the room. Yeah. He was forced to backtrack and come back with more. So do you think now he has obviously more national cachet? If they win, he'll have a little bit more leverage. Do you think he would have the ability, if the latter is the strategy that's being used, to convince his more ardent colleagues to back off and give the president a chance to lead. Well, he really aligned himself with the more with the more conservative faction. Uh, he has doing most of the attempts to deal with uh, the long-term deficit crisis. If you look at, he was on the Simpson Bowles Commission. He voted against that. Um, he was pushing Boehner not to accept a deal with President Obama, Obama right? He was on the, on the side that did not want uh, that deal to go down. In fact, the New York Times reported recently, you know, that quoted him as saying, uh, it's much better for us to win the election and do this on our own terms, so they didn't want Obama to get a political victory. So he was on the conservative side of that debate. When the Gang of Six in, in the Senate came out with their compromise, compromise legislation, he put out a, a, a long and detailed press release basically eviscerating that deal, which a lot of people in the conservative pundit class interpreted as, okay, we can't touch the Gang of Six deal. So he basically scuttled three attempts uh, at, at dealing with these issues in 2011 and 2012, aligned himself with the more conservative faction. Maybe it was as, as a result of the experience you're talking about, but I feel like by the, by the time he's picked as vice president, he no budget deal is considered conservative without Ryan's stamp of approval. So I would argue, yeah, he's going to have he's going to have a lot of leeway. He's going to be an effective messenger from Mitt Romney to, you know, I don't think he's going to let Mitt Romney be the Mitt Romney that you know Scott saw in Massachusetts. Um, but I think he has a lot of credibility with his colleagues in the House. I agree with all that. I would just make one point. Uh, Paul Ryan's political genealogy does not trace back to the austerity wing of the Republican Party notwithstanding everything you just said, which is true. He, when he worked for Jack Kemp at Empower America, I was the president of the organization, it was one of his first jobs 20 years ago, and the agenda was economic growth. I mean, you all knew Jack Kemp in those days, and Jack, Jack was an apostle, not of, very distinctly, not of draconian budget cuts and austerity, but of economic growth. And I'm not arguing at all that Paul, probably in response to a different budgetary situation that this country faces, that the world faces, has emphasized that side of it a lot, but I always remember uh, he schooled himself in growth economics, not austerity economics. Let me Just one final comment. I would totally agree with that. It's hard to square that, though, with what he has put in terms of what he wants to do on discretionary spending well, in his budget. I agree with that. Let me turn uh, to the question of a President Obama's second term. Um, several years ago, Norm and I co-edited a book on the Bush presidency, Bush second term, entitled Second Term Blues, How Bush Has Governed. Uh, and that title reflects, obviously, that Things didn't work out so well for Bush in the second term, especially politically. But we also did a longer look at second, pres second term presidents in general. And they really do have many similar characteristics. Uh, they rarely have a Congress of their own uh, party for the whole four years. They tend to not do as much of their own domestic agenda, sometimes some surprising compromises like tax reform or welfare reform. Uh, and then that they spend a lot more time in foreign policy. Let me turn to John. You were chief of staff in the second term. What are the what are the constraints on second term presidents and what are the, what are the opportunities? What do you see that, that President Obama is gonna face? Uh, well, let me begin by saying I would really rather answer the Republican question. <laughs> <laughs> so we can make this a little more exciting. It's a choice, anyway. not a referendum. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the, you know, in, in, in general, you have to look at the partisan makeup of the Congress. Uh, that, I think, uh, you pointed out, John, that, that that's critical. Uh, in, in Clinton's case, he faced Republican control in both houses for all four years. Uh, and you have to begin with, with that notion. Uh, on the other hand, I think the, the president has uh, several things going for him. I think he has a, he, the renewal of the mandate is really quite important. So if Obama's reelected, we've kind of put an end to the argument uh, that's been made about the, about the fact of whether he's taking the country off in some radically uh, different direction. And I think the public will have reendorsed uh, the general direction that he's uh, taking the country, and I think that's quite advantageous. Uh, secondly, he's got a more uh, seasoned administration. 
And I think that actually counts for a lot. It counted a lot uh, with respect to, uh, uh, I know, uh, President Clinton's second term. Um, they're able to go in and, uh, I think, engage the Congress in a way that uh, is both uh, from the years of experience, uh, and in that regard, I think particularly the 2011 uh, uh, negotiation with Speaker Boehner will influence how they approach what they want to try to do in terms of getting a big budget framework deal and deal with the uh, things that are happening at the end of the year, the expiration of the tax cuts, the uh, sequestration. And they're, they're, they're more seasoned at, I think, at execution of policy. So if you, if you shift to defense or foreign affairs, I think the, uh, the uh, things like the, the uh, pivot to, to Asia are, are baked in the cake with a bunch of people who have a lot uh, of uh, experience and thought behind that, and they're able to move that. How you're going to manage uh, a defense budget in a time of fiscal austerity you know, is being worked on now, and I think the execution of that uh, is really uh, quite important. In Clinton's case, he was able to get really a very important budget agreement done in that first year uh, with a Congress that was really quite hostile to him in 95 and 96. Ben and I worked together uh, during, during that period. But he was able to put a, bit, a major budget framework deal together and get, at, in my view, most of what he wanted. Expansion of the Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, tax cuts concentrated on working people, the expansion uh, of the child credit, et cetera. So I think he got most of what he wanted in that. I think Obama will be able to get most of what he wants, uh, particularly given the leverage that, uh, the, that the current law, if you will, uh, provides, which is, as I mentioned, the expiration of the tax cuts and uh, the full expiration of the tax cuts, including Obama's tax cuts that he in, uh, enacted in 2009, uh, and the sequester, which no one really wants. Democrats don't want that outcome. The Republicans don't want that outcome. But it gives the president the leverage uh, through the use even of a minority uh, in the Congress, but a veto-proof minority in the Congress, to extract a, a fairly good deal uh, and then proceed to implement the achievements that he had in the first term, and particularly in health care. Turn to Senator Daschle. If I could ask you to think uh, from your perch as Senate leader, what would a second term uh, presidency for Obama be like in relation to Congress? Uh, several things. One, are we going to see the, with presumably something of a divided government, part of the Congress probably in Republican hands, we're going to see the same sort of clashes over fiscal matters that we've seen regularly. Um, second, maybe you could think about some, some areas that would be good opportunities for the parties to work across the aisle. We mentioned some surprising ones from the past, the 1986 tax reform, welfare reform, where a president of one party and the, and the Congress of the other party found agreement. Uh, and then third, what's the special role of the Senate in this? The Senate really might be a fulcrum in here that might be very close. There sometimes requires a, a, a supermajority. Maybe Democrats will hold the Senate, the House. What's the, what's the special role of the Senate? Well, in his second term, the president would no longer be on a ballot. And that makes a big difference. Mitch McConnell made the somewhat infamous statement that his main goal was to defeat the president after his uh, election, and, and you won't have that. And so in, in one sense, you become less politicized. You become more, uh, at least you have the potential of being more statesmanlike in your ability to put the pieces together. He no longer has to depend to the degree he had to in his first term for nominations. He's going to have a lot of new vacancies, of course, and there's going to be turnover. Uh, but he's already established relationships on the committees and in, uh, in, in both bodies in an effort to, to build the, the, the momentum that's going to, going to come with that second term. So he's got, as John said, some experience. He's got the relationships to a certain extent. And I think the really the big key is whether or not the Republicans decide that uh, after this election, they're now going to have to work more closely with them than they did in the first term. So a lot of it's going to be subject to leadership and personalities. The degree to which they no longer view him as the sort of the, the political target that they did in the first term is the degree to which you're going to see more cooperation. On issues, I think 
surprisingly, perhaps, tax reform may be uh, at or near the top. There are going to be a lot of issues that are going to be driven, regardless of whether they want to find compromise or not. We're facing the so-called fiscal cliff with all of the issues involving uh, the, the, the tax cuts, uh, the uh, sustainable growth rate for doctor's reimbursement. Uh, you've got uh, a, a number of expiring provisions, uh, a whole array of challenges that are going to have to be addressed. There's really no, uh, uh, no recourse but to address it in some way. And I think mostly the Congress finds itself like a fire department. They're more likely to put out a fire, five alarm fire than they are to go to pre fire prevention. And you've got a number of five alarm fires that are coming up in December and will spill over until uh, into the, the, new, the new year. So given the urgency and sort of the crisis atmosphere, I think it creates more of an opportunity uh, for cooperation, not because they want to, but because they know they have to. And that's going to continue on for some time. But the real key is whether or not you can find better chemistry in the second four years than you did in the first four. Uh, that's, I would say, unlikely. Uh, but I think the only way we can see the kind of progress on these issues over time, once we get beyond this crisis cliff, uh, will be uh, whether or not we can build a better relationship. My hope is that it will be a more inclusive uh, environment. That is, that the Congress will be more inclusive of the administration as they consider their agenda. The administration will be more inclusive of Republicans and, and Democratic leadership as they consider theirs. That's the only real key to longer term, better chemistry and a better political environment. Um, let, me, let me follow up, uh, and using your uh, fire department analogy, uh, what happens when you have a fire department filled with pyromaniacs? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I want to just throw a thesis out to you, which is that in the next Senate, which you know very well, um, I think you're going to find a significant collection of Republicans, if, a, if there's a second Obama term, who want to work with them to solve some problems. I've had a number of them say to me, we're tired of voting no on everything and we want to do things. And that's Lamar Alexanders and Bob Corkers of the world joining with the Saxby Shambliss uh, uh, and uh, uh, Gang of Six uh, Wing and some others. Um, but in the House, you're going to have a more polarized group. You've had a number of Tea Party freshmen who've been challenged in primaries from the right because they've gone Washington. Uh, and uh, uh, we've seen now in this Congress a couple of instances where the Senate did come together recently we had 74 votes for a transportation bill. We had 74 votes for a farm bill. And those bills go to the House, broad bipartisan majorities in the Senate, working with the President. Nothing happens for months. Uh, how do you deal with that situation? And then, just to put another little twist on it, how does Mitch McConnell, whom you know very well from your interactions, deal with the fact that he's not only going to have the problem-solving wing enlarged, but the dement wing the people like Richard Murdoch and Ted Cruz coming in who say, well, our idea of compromise is they come to us, or if not, we crush them. And many of them are running by saying, we're not going to commit to voting for Mitch McConnell as leader until we get commitments from him. Uh, how does that complicate matters for a second term Obama? Is there another question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I. I, I as I said, this is really going to be complicated because a lot of the personalities are going to be the same and the new ones are going to be even more strident in many respects. But I come back to my point about crises. I mean, we are facing some extraordinary crises. And I think that, and, and crisis is such an overused word in Washington, I'm reluctant to use it, but, but very serious challenges that our country knows it's got to address. And I think the political viability of either party is going to be dependent in part on how they are viewed as addressing those challenges going forward. If they fail and if we reach the calamitous circumstances that could easily uh, begin to uh, unfold, um, I think the politics of that has got to be suicidal. And so they know in many respects that the circumstances are only going to get worse. And that ought to be a catalyst for some degree of new political environment for consensus building. As I said, you, you've laid it out so well, uh, but I, I think the other option is it's even worse than what it has been in the last couple of years as you look at what failure could mean for our country. It's even worse than it looks. <laughs> uh, then I, let me just follow up with you on, on this front. You know John Boehner. Tom was doing really well. That's right. <laughs> you know John Boehner very well. 
and when Boehner was uh, first uh, uh, elected speaker, when it became clear he was going to be speaker, the first thing he did was to try and send a message to his new members and some of his more ardent conservatives, hey, now we've got a responsibility, we're in the majority, we've got to be adults here, and that includes things we're not going to like, like the debt limit. Now, fast forward a year, and it's Boehner who's saying, we're going to hold the debt limit hostage again, and I'm the guy who's going to do it. So we've seen a real change, which is, I, su I suspect, more a reflection of the changes in his caucus than Boehner himself. How much can Boehner, whether it's an Obama presidency or a Romney presidency, control his own forces and be a leader instead of a waif among those forces? That's a good question, too. Um, Tom, <laughs> would you like to? Uh, yes. um, to a substantial extent, but, but not as much as he would like or I would like or a President Romney or Obama would, would like. I do think I have to say, I'm not gonna quarrel with your description of, of the two chambers. I do think in private conversations, a lot of the new members on the House side who came in breathing fire have learned how, this, how the government works and have learned and, and I'm not predicting a wholesale ideological shift, but I think that a, a lot of them will have a little bit different attitude towards some of these issues after having lived through the credit downgrade of the United States and being educated on the implications of a real budget uh, catastrophe. Uh, so I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful. Remember that you've, you've known Boehner a long time too. He came up into the speakership in a little bit unusual way. Most people who move to the top ranks of leadership in their party stay in leadership and just move up the leadership ladder. He got tossed out of leadership and went over and did something unusual, which is to become a committee chairman and then come back and become the, the speaker. He was a good committee chairman and he worked uh, in, in, the, in a committee that is quite polarized between Republicans, Democrats, the Education and Labor Committee. He is a legislator. He knows how to work with the other side of the aisle. Yeah, the last couple of years have been enormously frustrating and angered people on both sides of the aisle. But he has the ability to reach out and deal with the other side um, if that's necessary. And I, I very much agree with Tom. Uh, it's necessary. And I think if you, if you wonder how can this all happen given the positions that, in my view, Democrats take on entitlements, position Republicans take on taxes, well, it's all, it's, you throw your hands up people are going to have to change their minds about some things. And I think that the election will pr provide a change in environment that gives us at least the opening to do that. And if we, if we fail, uh, we're all in big trouble. Let me turn to Ryan. Uh, John, you, John you, had a, yeah. one of those. Oh, sure. Well, I just, the power equation is going to change, not just because of the election, but because of the expiration of these tax cuts. So that this burn your house down will bluff, it's, they're not bluffs, I think. They're, will, they're willing to take the country over the cliff. Attitude ends up with a result that they don't want. And at some point, they're gonna have to kind of understand that and say, are we, gonna have a, are we gonna have a dialogue so that we can have a tax reform bill that produces enough revenue uh, along the lines probably of Simpson Bowles or something of that nature? And are we going to do it in a fair way that supports the middle class as opposed to the wealthiest Americans? If they say no to that, they produce a result that brings us back to the tax code I was quite proud of, the Clinton tax code, that, that I think in the short term is, is problematic because of its impact on demand in the U.S., uh, but maybe in the long term that's not the worst thing in the world. But if they're going to get that sentence, Excuse doesn't that presuppose that, that the administration is good? Obama, if reelected, would have to embrace Simpson Bowles much more? heartily than, than he has heretofore. I think he'll have to embrace a fiscal path that stabilizes the debt and bring, begins to bring it down. Uh, and I think that, you know, we can go back and forth about whether they could have, would have, should have on Simpson Bowles uh, in 2000 uh, and, uh, and 10. But I think that basically what he has signaled is, is that he wants to see revenue increased, not quite as much as Simpson Bowles, and he wants to see spending reduced, again, particularly on the defense side, not quite as much as Simpson Bowles. But I think he is in that zone, whereas Ryan and Romney are well outside of that zone. Logic of Simpson Bowles, by the way, is always, in addition to the economic logic of it, which I embrace, I've always thought and still think in terms of the problems we're facing next year that John just talked about, Tom talked about, 
it is easier to do a great big deal than it is to do a bunch of narrow deals. I, I agree with the notion that tax reform is probably the most apparent right now, but if the, if the job is to nudge enough Republicans into a position where they're gonna vote for a revenue increase, if it's just a tax increase and nothing else, you're not gonna get them. That's why the, putting all the, pa the, the pieces of the package together at the end of the day is an easier political lift in my judgment than lifting them all one by one. Yeah. Bipartisan agreement. I mean, isn't that the, wasn't that the case, John, in 97 and even a little bit in 2010, where it wasn't the two sides necessarily coming to the middle, but it was a series of trades. You get your right wing thing, we'll give you the left wing thing. I mean, it makes kind of, uh, maybe not the, the prettiest package in the end, but when you have a lot of moving parts, you have a lot of pieces to trade. I think if people are, you know, the problem in, in 2011 was that dynamic was available and they couldn't close. And, you know, we blame Boehner they blamed the president, but in the end of the day, uh, that negotiation, I think, taught probably the president and the White House a, a bunch of lessons about how to negotiate with this crowd. I Rock. think, I think in, in, in terms of that negotiation, the president rightfully has to be cautious about how much ownership he's going to take in a public way on one of these issues, and there's no better example of that than Obamacare. I mean, he takes basically a Republican set of ideas and adopts them as his own, and it becomes an anathema to the Republican Party. That same thing could have happened, I think, with Obama budget or Obama tax or Obama anything. He's got to be inclusive, but he's also got to be deferential in terms of not creating too much of a persona around an issue that prevents the Republicans from stepping forward. It arguably happened with the stimulus, which a lot of Republicans used to think is not such a exactly. bad word, and cap and trade, which was uh, sort of born in conservative think tanks. Can I note that uh, in Massachusetts, when Romney, when he came in, he was faced with a, a, a fairly substantial budget gap, and he closed it. Uh, he had run, of course, as, as uh, Republicans usually do, even in Massachusetts, as someone who would not uh, favor new taxes. And he closed it, um, a gap of about $2 billion, uh, or with, with uh, 750 of new revenue, and, the, and the, the rest with cuts. So, you know, vaguely in the, in the area probably right. Simpson Bowles would do. Now, they, these were things that fell reasonably hard on the business community. In the business community, they called it loophole closings, but they did consider it taxes. Um, and there were a lot of fees that went up too. They just weren't broad-based taxes. So he's done that in the past, Romney. But in, in this case, of course, he's, he's pledged that all the, um, all the loophole closings and the broadening of the base will go to pay for an additional tax cut. So I, I, there was a real question of whether he could sort of wiggle free of, of that position. Can I ask Ryan, Ryan, you've done reporting on uh, President Obama's second term. A lot of second term presidents have pretty optimistic ideas of what their legislative agenda is. Bush, if you remember, was gonna do social security reform, tax reform, uh, he was coming off a new mandate, he was reorganizing his government, putting his White House people in the cabinet positions. Uh, what has the Obama administration thought about in the second term? What, what, what are their hopes and what, what are their, what's their blueprint that they're thinking about now? Well, I think what's really unique about this situation is whoever wins, we sort of know what they have to address immediately because we have these looming deadlines and we have the fiscal cliff. So whether it's Romney or Obama, they have to address that. There's no way around that. And addressing that is a, a pretty big deal because you can rewrite the tax code, you can uh, deal with the long-term deficits. I mean, you're getting a chance to, uh, to, to, to take a, a really hard, detailed look at the relationship between uh, or how big is the, the size and scope of government. And that's gonna happen no matter who's elected. I think that's one of the really unique things about this election. Um, after they get past that, the thing that I heard the most about when I was reporting on that was immigration reform. And the theory there is, well, if Obama wins, what is the lesson that the Republican Party takes away? And I think that was what Senator Daschle was getting at. Um, that's sort of the key to the whole uh, Obama second term is what does his opposition, uh, uh, what, what's their lesson from his, uh, from his reelection? Now, arguably, one, one lesson would be Wow, we just got wiped out uh, in the Hispanic community. If the polls that uh, if, if if Romney loses and the and the polls uh, among Hispanics right now hold, uh, one lesson is that Demo that Republicans have a serious issue with the demography of this country, and that maybe going back to uh, where McCain was in 2008 or George W. Bush was in his presidency, 
uh, on immigration reform is a wise course. And then, so after you get past the fiscal cliff, immigration reform could be that your, 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 your sweet spot for a, for a bipartisan agreement. I know that Obama has said privately that um, if, he thought, if he was thinking, uh, if he could do anything, and if he's thinking long term, in a second term, what are, what are two things that would have impact decades from now? Uh, he has said dealing with climate change. Uh, now, politically, I, I don't know if anyone disagrees, but that seems awfully difficult, uh, no matter what. And the second thing was dealing uh, with, uh, with, with loose nukes and nuclear pro proliferation. He has said that those are the two things that he, he you know, what, long after he's gone, uh, that a second term would be, you know, he'd be very proud to have uh, accomplished that in a second term. On foreign policy, I think the, the, the thing that the folks in, in the, at the National Security Council talk a lot about this pivot to Asia. They're very proud of, of, uh, of, of the relationship, of, of sort of this soft containment strategy of reaching out to China's competitors in the region uh, and sort of hemming in China a little bit, and, and, and they, they feel like that's long term a very important policy. Um, and you know, those, those, that's the sort of circle of issues that, that came up the most when I was doing that reporting. Let's talk about foreign policy uh, a little bit more. Um, I was struck then uh, at how little foreign policy came up in the major speeches at the convention in Tampa. Yeah. Um, the only one who mentioned Afghanistan was uh, Clint Eastwood. And, uh, <laughs> and he didn't really have the Republican uh, position on that. No, did he? And, and you know, it was <laughs> really pretty. I'm not sure what the Republican position he is on yeah. Afghanistan. Well, you, yeah. What was amusing was to watch as he said it, and people didn't know whether to applaud or uh, boo uh, because it was, let's pull them all out now. Uh, but the fact that it wasn't mentioned otherwise, including in Romney's speech, was itself uh, pretty striking. So talk a little bit about how much they've thought about some of these major issues, including the hot button ones like Afghanistan and Iraq, and what disagreement there is internally about what to do on those issues, as there is in the country, and as we know there is in both parties, but particularly in the Republican Party now. And then I'd ask you one other little question as well, which is, uh, there was at least some discussion of the need to reach out to the rest of the world. The, the Bush uh, legacy, both in terms of uh, AIDS, the Millennium Challenge Fund, but the use of smart Larry. power, um, and the widespread acceptance of that, and how that works when you've got a budget plan that would basically eviscerate all of discretionary spending. And if you're in a contest with where the money's gonna go, how is foreign aid uh, or development uh, gonna survive? Is it me or? <coughs> oh, uh, was that's, a, that's a big question. For, first of all, I would say, I, I, you're right, there wasn't any discussion seriously at the Convention of Foreign Policy. Some of us were doing panels like this and talking about it, but it was not on the convention floor. And that's unfortunate, but not unexpected given that we got serious, serious economic problems that are preoccupying the country. Romney has a very robust, well-developed foreign policy advisory operation, both professional staff and outside volunteer thinkers in that, and it's, it's functioning well works systematically. I, I have no concerns whatsoever about him getting the right kind of advice, just being able to assemble the right kind of people around him. And they represent the breadth of thinking within the Republican Party, which is actually, in my view, broader than it has been for a long time. Uh, some of that is, ob is, ob is obscured a little bit, but, uh, you know, for instance, if our friend uh, Haley Barber had run for president, it would have been very interesting governor of Mississippi, former chairman of the Republican Party, who was basically saying, we need to get out of Afghanistan right now. That would have been a real debate over foreign policy in the Republican Party. It didn't really happen. But there are more people, on thinkers on the, in, on the right, George Will, people like that, who are saying that, that kind of thing about international, about intervention and, and uh, uh, military involvements around the world. The foreign aid issue is one that I spend a lot of time on, some of it in a project with Tom, uh, a lot working with Secretary Albright, and, and I'm, I'm concerned about it. I, I don't, I agree with uh, the notion, uh, and I think you made the point, that the short term disc budget cuts are not totally unnecessary, but are, can be really self-destructive. I mean, our problem with the budget is the long term budget, not the short term budget. And we are doing damage to important programs in the short run, more than we need to because of our refusal to deal with the long-term problem. 
least that's my interpretation of the politics of this. We can't deal with any of these long-term issues, so by God, we're going to be tough on the short-term spending, and we wake up when it's over and find out that, that we've cut the things that Republicans and Democrats really have agreed on in the past as the proper functions of government, things that they should focus on. Foreign aid is going to be uh, one of the most important. Unfortunately, it's the least popular thing in the budget. Tom's run for office in the Midwest, as I have. I used to say only half jokingly, I think my constituents thought that the federal budget was 80% foreign aid and the rest was congressional salaries. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, we know that it's minuscule, but the average voter does not, and it's, just, it's, uh, it's, it's under threat. The only good piece of news I can attach to that, as somebody who always supported uh, development assistance, foreign aid, thinks that it's a good expenditure, believes in soft power, is that and from a development standpoint, increasingly the economies of uh, what we used to think of as third world nations, we don't use that term anymore, are being boosted by private investment from American companies and companies around the world. So the federal, the federal development budget that we're talking about is leverage, it's important, and it's important from a diplomatic standpoint. It is not quite as important from a standpoint of bringing people out of poverty as it was in the past. Scott, did, did you, uh, uh, famously, Sarah Palin said she, as a state governor, could see uh, Russia from Alaska, and that was helpful for her foreign policy. Do we see any hints of Romney's international outlook from his time in Massachusetts, time as a businessman? Well, we, we saw a little bit when the former uh, president of Iran came to speak at the Kennedy School, Katami, I may be mispronouncing his name, but he came to give a, a talk. He, he was considered sort of a, a uh, ineffectual reformer. And um, Mitt labeled him terrorist tied and refused to provide any uh, any state police escort from the uh, from the uh, airport, and, and it was seen as you know a little just playing to the cheap seats. I think in general, if you read uh, Mitt's book, No Apology, uh, you, you, you it uh, comes off very much as someone who's kind of cramming for a foreign policy final. It's, it's never a, a, a subject that he's had a particular mastery of. I, I think Norma's right. Condoleezza Rice spoke at the convention. She could have been speaking really much more to the Tea Party than, uh, other than what she said about free trade. We need to do more free trade agreements. But her, her idea that we needed to keep involved in the world, stay involved in the world, seemed to be as much a, a message to the, uh, the Republican right wing, maybe, as, as to the Obama administration. I don't see a huge vulnerability um, for, for Obama on foreign policy. And I think other than the, the display of bluster in pursuit of the notion that he might be a little tougher, and I think it's all atmospherics, Romney does not have any substantial differences with Obama on foreign policy, which is why we didn't really see a critique, I think. Tom. I was, was going to say about the same thing. I, I, and I, I think the Obama administration deserves a lot of credit, first of all, for selecting an extraordinary Secretary of State. I think Hillary Clinton has done a, a remarkable job. And, but I think you look at all the complicated issues, whether it's Iraq, Afghanistan, the Middle East, uh, uh, the, you know, all that's happened in Northern Africa. I mean, every one of these challenges could be fodder for, in the, for the political grist, and we haven't seen it, in part because I think of the competence that the Obama administration has largely demonstrated in, in this whole array of challenges. That doesn't mean they're going to continue to be uh, non-political, but I think uh, Romney will have a hard time finding areas where he can truly fault this administration on foreign policy. Let me, uh, one last question, then we're going to go to uh, the uh, audience. It's a kind of a stereotype in second terms that presidents turn more and more to foreign policy, partly because they've tapped out on ideas in domestic affairs or the ideas that they have, if they didn't get through in the first term, are going to be harder in the second and it's more frustrating. You have a little bit more of an opportunity in the world. Um, John, Tom, or any of you, do you think that that will happen with Obama? Will he invest a lot more of his own personal time and energy in foreign policy uh, in a second term? Well, look, I think the challenges are here at home. They're to strengthen the economy, get jobs growing, create a fair tax system. That's what's going to preoccupy him in the second term. And, you know, having served a president who up to the very end was deeply involved in trying to push forward domestic initiative, I think that sometimes that, th that uh, the press kind of relies and falls back on that. Now, Clinton was obviously also involved with Camp David in the f a aftermath of that uh, with negotiations around the world. But primarily, he stayed focused on domestic affairs to the very end. Tom will remember, after Bush v. Gore, 
Congress hadn't passed a budget. We, we were in the Oval Office right before Christmas. Uh, they finally came up with an agreement uh, on the budget. We were there with the Republican leadership, and everybody got up to leave, uh, and Clinton put his hand on Speaker Hastert's knee and said, Denny, remember when we went out to Chicago and we committed to uh, put uh, tax relief into the communities that needed it the most, into, into urban centers and Indian reservations, rural communities? He said, why don't we just put that in the budget? And everybody looked at Trent Lott, and he looked, you remember this, Tom, he, his, the blood drained from his face. <laughs> Tom said, let's do it. Gephardt said, let's do it. And finally, Lott said, okay, let's do it. So that was after the election had been decided, after Bush v. Gore, three weeks left. I mean, he was still focused on that. It was important to him. It was $23 billion in poor communities in the country. And I think Obama will approach the, the job much in the same way. I think if he has a choice, he's going to spend as much time as possible on the domestic challenges that we all agree are, 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 are in desperate need of addressing. But sometimes the president doesn't have a choice. I don't know what's going to happen in Iran, but I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, optimistic that we can continue to rumble along with that. China will present a whole new set of circumstances. You know, we don't know what will happen uh, uh, as, as Afghanistan closes out. So you've got all these unknowns out there, all of which could become incredibly time-consuming if the circumstances warrant. We won't know that until it happens. We're going to turn to audience questions, and I don't, can't see very well out there, but I believe there are a couple of mics, oh. uh, uh, one on each side. If, if you could uh, stand up and please identify yourself. I see somebody coming here. If not, I will be interviewing this empty chair here for the next few minutes. Uh. Those never get old. Oh. Uh, here we go. Here's a uh, question right here on the right. I don't know how you can see a thing. No microphone. I'll repeat it. Go ahead. They're on the corner. They're on the side there. I'm over here, right? Yeah, and there's some also over here. We'll, we'll, we'll take a question here. We'll go back and forth. And we'll start here, and then we'll move up. Uh, start, start down here. Okay, yeah. start. Well, no, I mean, either just okay. yeah, yeah. Start right here. Yeah. Go ahead. We hear a lot in this election cycle about the middle class and the wealthy. 47 million Americans live below the poverty line. Which party, is either party con concerned about the poor, and how will either party deal with 3.5 million American homeless. Well, I, I, I can start by saying I, I, think, I think that's basically what the Democrats have, have uh, been all about uh, ever since I've been involved in politics, is to try to figure out a way to ensure that everybody has more opportunity, whether it's ensuring that they have uh, health care through Medicaid in the 60s, now through Obamacare and the uh, with the latest iteration, uh, the S-CHIP program, the Children's uh, Health Insurance program, uh, a whole array of, 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 of efforts to try to ensure that they have a, a greater access at better income with increases in the minimum wage. We've got a long, long way to go, and we've had huge obstacles to face as every one of these efforts have, have been addressed. But uh, I don't think there's any question. Democrats care deeply about the less privileged and, and, uh, and about uh, the need to ensure that there's equal opportunity in this country. I'm going to turn here. Uh, well, no, go I, ahead. Go ahead. I, yeah. I, I think it's a, a hugely important issue. My party never pays enough attention to it, in my view. But I don't think the Democrats have done very much on it the last four years either. And I think we need much more attention paid by both parties to this issue. It's not the same as shoring up the middle class. Poverty is a different issue. And I think we sometimes conflate all these issues in our mind, redistribution of income, poverty, shoring up the middle class. They are different issues. The problems of the hardcore uh, poor in this country are, are different problems that require different attention. And there's a separate issue, it's related but different, which is the fact that social mobility in this country is basically, basically frozen. You know, and, and that is a particular challenge, I would argue, to my party's economic thinking, where we've always said, you don't need to quite pay as much attention to redistribution of income as the Democrats want, because people are always moving up in America. That has ceased to be the case for a, over a long period of time. And that issue of mobility, as well as the issue of poverty that the questioner raises, both need more attention from both parties. 
I'm going to turn over, uh, over here. If you could uh, identify yourself and hear, hear, hear your question. This will be a brief question in French that will be translated into English. Mitt Romney could be here doing that, right? <laughs> Republicans can't answer Fred's questions yeah. in French. I, you know. yes. Merci. Je suis Madame Eve Bazaiba, députée nationale de la République démocratique du Congo. Vous comprenez par là que je veux me focaliser sur la politique internationale, la politique extérieure des Américains. Il me semble que qu'on soit républicain ou démocrate au niveau de l'Afrique, nous ressentons la même chose, la politique extérieure. Nous voulons que cette fois-ci, qu'il y ait un changement. Euh, J'ai suivi euh, le démocrate dire si jamais le président Obama était réélu, l'accent au niveau extérieur sera plus sur la protection euh, de l'environnement, le réchauffement climatique, ainsi que euh, les, la problématique des armes nucléaires. Le, au niveau de l'Afrique, la République démocratique du Congo renferme 85% de la réserve mondiale en ce qui concerne l'équilibre international. Et puis, euh, nous avons l'uranium. Bon, la guerre au niveau euh, de la région des Grands Lacs, est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que vous devez faire plus attention euh, pour qu'il y ait la paix dans le monde à ce sujet Merci. This is uh, <laughs> Congresswoman Eve Bazeba from the Democratic Republic of Congo. So her question is related to uh, the US, US foreign policy. And uh, she noted that in the, the, uh, in the discussion of the future policy uh, priorities, there was a lot of emphasis on the environment. And she wanted to hear more about uh, focus on on Africa, on bringing peace in, in, uh, to areas uh, like the DRC in Congo in Africa. Ben, Tom, uh, you're Well, I, I, first of all, I would say that your point is well taken. I think Africa needs to be the focus of a great deal of additional attention, regardless of, of uh, who wins elections. Uh, as we go forward, I'm encouraged by the tremendous effort at increased economic uh, vitality and democratization as I see throughout Africa. In fact, if I understand it correctly, Africa has enjoyed the fastest economic growth rate, the highest economic growth rate of, uh, of any continent in the, United, in the world over the last 10 years. So there's been great progress, but so much more needs to be done. Uh, China recognizes that. We've seen their presence in countries uh, all over Africa. And I think as the Bush administration and the Obama administrations have demonstrated our commitment through the Millennium Fund in particular, and uh, in our effort to address AIDS uh, specifically, have uh, been at least uh, a, a very strong beginning in developing a closer relationship and an improved understanding of the importance of that relationship as we go forward. But as Ben said with regard to addressing the poor in this country, so much more needs to be done. Let me, let me follow up with Vin. Uh, my colleague, Dan Glickman, uh, likes to tell the story that his visits to Africa, uh, Africans come and say to him, you know, the three greatest American presidents have been uh, Clinton, uh, Bush, and Obama, and maybe, maybe Bush the most. Uh, Bush, perhaps, uh, against Because of AIDS, AIDS, of AIDS yeah, and malaria. Right? Because of uh, things that maybe people don't associate with Republican presidents. What, do, what would we know about a Romney uh, policy towards uh, Africa? The missionary... Uh, evangelical community, the parts well, of the Republican so. base which are interested? What's, what's uh, Mitt Romney? I, I, th I think so and I hope so. I mean, it, unfortunately, in the, during the Bush administration, the only place where the image of America, according to the Pew Research polls, got better was Sub-Saharan Africa. And it was because we invested money in AIDS and malaria and did other things there. But that's not lost on, on this team that has surrounded Governor Romney. And I, I hope, uh, and he's very well aware of it, and we talk about it quite often, I hope it will have an impact on his attitude on some of the issues we've talked about. Can I also mention, if I understood the question, at the end of the question, you talked about something beyond economic assistance and talked about, you know, yeah. if I can use the word genocide and things like that that take place. Um, Secretary Albright and Rich Williamson, who is one of Governor Romney's top foreign policy advisors, co-chaired a project on the prevention, of, uh, on the responsibility to protect an outgrowth of another policy, uh, pro project on the prevention of genocide. And I've served on both of those task forces with them. So there's a bipartisan, I think, consensus developing that we gotta think through how the government can appropriately act to, pr to prevent atrocities from occurring around the world 
without getting in the position of having to send in the Marines. And, and you know, I would be hopeful that that's the direction we'll move, regardless of who's elected, frankly. Great. Can I just uh, add one, one thing yeah. quickly? I was, before I was talking about the priorities that Obama wishes, you know, hopes he can get to, I know that he also has said privately that development uh, is, international development is something that, uh, that was a priority coming in and hasn't been something that he's been able to emphasize as much and something he'd like to do in a second term. But either party's you know, foreign policy is expensive and unless the U.S. economy recovers, unless our right. long-term fiscal situation improves, neither party's foreign policy is going to be, at least as described now, is going to be fully impl implemented. So we've got to get our, our own That's house right. in order before we take on some of these other issues. Brian, do you have any sense, or did you get from your conversations, of who uh, would be Secretary of State in a second uh, Obama term? Uh, frankly, no. I mean, the same names that people in Washington seem to circulate, or maybe the people who want to be Secretary of State <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, circulate. Circulate their own names. <laughs> <laughs> and John Kerry's mm -hmm. name comes up quite a bit. Um, but uh, I don't. I don't, I, I don't know. I bet, I bet uh, Podesta over here has much better insight into that than I do. I wouldn't talk about it. So that's okay. <laughs> Got that right. uh, but actually, let me uh, follow up in a larger sense with you on this, John. How difficult is it? You get a lot of turnover in a second term. This time, we know, I mean, you're going to have impediments to, uh, in the nomination and confirmation process, maybe a bit reduced because we did get this hardening yeah. small agreement in the Senate to reduce the numbers. How difficult is it to get top flight people to come in in a second term. Uh, you don't have that level of excitement uh, that you had in the first, and it's a hassle. Look, it's a great honor to serve at, at, at that level of government, and I think people are still attracted to it. It's certainly a um, miserable process that uh, I think we've developed, uh, put way too much politics in it. A president deserves, and I say that as someone who served uh, on the Senate staff and, 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 and served Leader Daschle, that the a president is entitled in these uh, executive branch departments to have the people that he wants as his team, unless there's something really specific about that person that makes them disqualified for the job. And we, we've slowed that process down. Hopefully this legislation will bump it up a little bit. But I don't think there's going to be any real problem in getting people to want to serve uh, because the challenges are enormous, uh, the ability to accomplish uh, big things really s is still there, and I think that uh, you know people have a sense that this is a president who, you know, who wants who wants to see solid performance. Norm, you and I have talked about this before. I think one of the things that happened in the first couple of years was, in some ways, the focus to the exclusion of running the executive branch on passing legislation. But that's changed in the last couple of years. So I think it'll have a lot of continuity. It's got a lot of strong people, uh, people who the Republicans even used to like, like you know, uh, Artie Duncan in the Department of Education, uh, Sean Donovan and HUD and others, who will stay with him. There's some big changes that are afoot. Obviously, Secretary Clinton uh, will uh, move on after this term, probably Secretary Geithner relatively quickly. Uh, but I think he'll get, you know, the great people still want to serve in government, and I, th I don't think he'll have any uh, uh, problem in convincing people that they can make a really big difference in this country. You know, one other thing on the names, one, you know, historically close White House advisors, either on the economic side or the foreign policy side, often move to Treasury uh, or, or the State Department. So uh, I don't know if Tom Donilon is interested in that job, but he'd be an obvious candidate. Hey, we can go over here for another sure. question. Yeah. Or, well, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Weber a very. Okay, I'm sorry. I was, I was, I knew I was supposed to look to the back, but I didn't know I was look to the balcony. How about, how about we will go here? We got a good team up here. That's where, yeah, yeah, we got <laughs> supporting our region. Um, <laughs> I, um, I wanted to ask a question about the the word crisis was thrown out by uh, Tom Daschle, and I want to know how things with inside Washington get identified as crises while other things outside of Washington are, are identified as crises. And I'll give a specific example, which is the drug war. Um, the drug war in the last six years has left 60,000 civilians dead in Mexico, has armed the coup government in Honduras, a repressive coup government. Inside the US, you have the world's largest incarcerated population. 25% of the world's prisoners are here in the United States. How is it that this issue is not mentioned by any of you or by anybody else in an election campaign while all this talk about tax reform is endless? <laughs> uh, 
I think it's a great question. I, I, there are, there are uh, I think the, 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 the main criteria is the degree to which uh, Americans are affected. How broadly are they affected? And uh, y your, your statistics point out the growing uh, effect that, uh, that these challenges and issues are having within our country, but they haven't reached the proportions yet, I think, that, uh, that some of these other challenges have. They also don't face any of these immediate deadlines that we were talking about with regard to the fiscal cliff. And so for those reasons, and they haven't for some reason, even though I think they should, generate the kind of media attention that, uh, that some of these other issues have. So for those reasons, I don't think they're perceived quite as urgently and in Washington as, as they probably should be. But your, your question poses, I think, the dilemma that policymakers today face. How do you put together an agenda that uh, takes into account the severity, the depth, and the impact that each of these challenges have for our country? I think also in the context of a political campaign, uh, Romney could not go there even if he weren't so inclined because of the Republican right wing, and Obama would not go there in terms of some sort of drug legalization or, or different policy because he, he would be worried about opening a new front and where, where he could be perceived as, as weak on something, and he doesn't want to argue an election inside the confines of that particular box. So this is one of those issues that you're, you just will not see fought out uh, in, a, in a political campaign. I think we're going to go up the balcony on the left here. Oh. <clears throat> well, to follow, follow his point uh, about the domestic issues, we look at our problem with immigration reform. Uh, when we look at uh, election seasons, there seems to be a lot of focus on what we will do and should do, but nothing ever really gets done about it. I think it translates into our issues with the health care system, the cost that is uh, taken on by most of us that do pay our fair share, for most of us that are legally here, uh, not to say that anyone isn't welcome here, but we always talk about during election times, we're going to do something about it. Then we get there and we say, well, it's the tax issue. Uh, it's a distribution of wealth. No one, no party really addresses it after the fact. I'd like to know who and how can we address those issues when will we address those issues? And when they won't just be political talking points? Well, I, I, let me start on that. I don't know how, I mean, I think you can agree with Obamacare or you can disagree with Obamacare. I agree with it, uh, it's being implemented, but I don't know how you could say that the president didn't follow through on the commitment he made in the campaign. Immigration. I'm not saying what? Obamacare specifically. I'm just talking you about- said more specifically and more generally in the economy. Okay. Uh, let me, let me, okay. let, let's, let's go to, I mean, there, there are two questions. One, the general question of how much follow through there is from campaign promises, but also I think immigration reform seemed like his, his uh, so let's, let's take either one of those on. Well, look, the president's done, he, he's, uh, I think he tried to find, uh, I was at a meeting with a, a number of members of the Bush, former members of the Bush administration, tried to find bipartisan support for comprehensive immigration reform, that stalled tried to pass the DREAM Act, that stalled against Republican opposition. He's finally taken uh, the executive step of uh, deciding not to deport kids who were brought here uh, as youth uh, who uh, have uh, stayed in school, graduated from uh, high school, uh, gone into the military, et cetera. I think that's an important step in the right direction. Uh, but I think that at some point, you know, I think that he's, uh, tried and he's been rebuffed. I think he'll try again. Ben, if there's but a I thought the import of, his, of that question was really broader about whether politicians just talk and they don't act. And I think, quite frankly, people in both parties act on what they say. Uh, I worked for a guy who used to check off the things he said in 1992 in 1999. Uh, that he had promised the American people. I think President Bush did the same thing. I disagreed with what he promised the American public. I think he made a mistake in the pursuit of the economic policy uh, that drove his administration, but he delivered what he said. So I think we should take Governor Romney and President Obama quite seriously. When they put down the Ryan budget, that is what they're gonna try to produce. And I That's think right. uh, equally validly, I think President Obama will, it will have something to say here on Thursday night, and we ought to hold them to it. 
So maybe two, two parts of the question you're right. Ben, maybe we can ask you, did uh, Republicans control Congress and Mitt Romney's president? What happens on immigration reform? When? How serious is it? Well, and, and then I've got a question. For uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm an old style Republican on immigration. Uh, Reagan, George W. Bush, John McCain. I, I have a hard time understanding how my party can believe in the relatively free flow of good services and capital across boundaries, but draw the line when it comes to people. Uh, <laughs> that's just not where I am. Uh, but, but I have to say I'm not optimistic about us reaching a comprehensive solution, even though I think it's the right thing to do. You know, the, the best argument might, might be the political argument if the Republicans lose in this election and you can make a plausible argument that it's because of their poor performance with the Hispanic voter, you might find a political argument that counters the argument you're seeing right now with the politics of the issue. I, I wish I could report that it's getting easier to be for comprehensive reform in the Republican Party. I don't think it is. And Scott, Scott John brought up uh, properly both Clinton and, and Bush, very much agenda presidents. They had five things on their agenda. They're checking them off. They're sticking to it. Is Mitt Romney like that? Was he like that Massachusetts governor? Does he have a, a, set of, a set of things he wants to do and then really wants to follow through one well, at a time? Well, he had a long checklist of things that he said he had promised, and, and he went down and, and when, as he prepared to leave office, said, I've completed them all, and this has been a, he said, I've been a, amazed or pleased by this whirlwind of accomplishment, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, was, uh, it was really more like a kind of a pleasant afternoon breeze of accomplishment, I think, rather than a whirlwind. He did get some things done, and, and he took some things seriously, but he was an awful lot about political packaging. You'll hear an awful lot about, say, the John and Abigail Adams scholarships, and, and uh, as though this were a huge thing. It essentially waves um, one part of the tuition, but not fees, and fees are the m much bigger part going to a state school in Massachusetts. Uh, but he would have you think, say, that he's granted free tuition for the top achievers when actually the, the scholarship isn't, a, isn't important enough really to, to get a lot of people in. So I, I think he's such a, a um, kind of an ideological work in progress. I mean, the ide ideology is more a, a journey than a destination for Mitt. And I, so I don't think that you are going to see things in this campaign where he will say, I promised you this and I delivered because frankly, he's promised things that are so incompatible. You can't, the, the, the math just doesn't work on say, a balanced budget and protecting and strengthening Medicare, which really means substantially cutting it for, for future generations. I don't think you will, I mean, other than a packaging way, I don't think you'll see that in a really honest way, no. We have uh, uh, only about five mi more minutes, uh, and I know uh, one of our panelists has to leave as well. Maybe we can take uh, several questions at once and then get some final reflections uh, from, from our well, Let's uh, do this. Let's take a question here and a question here and, and try to package them together. Yeah. Hello, I'm from California, and in Los Angeles, there's about 200 different languages that are spoken. Each party has its difficulties reaching across uh, racial lines, demographic lines, gender lines. In this election, we've seen, you know, the so-called war against women, or you know, Romney doesn't like poor people, or Obama's a socialist. I mean, we, we have a big problem in our political system with marginalizing the other side. Uh, from the conservative standpoint, which you know, I'm conservative, let me get that out there. Uh, you know, Republicans were supportive of Marco Rubio. Uh, he's as conservative as Paul Ryan, but uh, he helps address the huge demographic problems the Republican Party has. Uh, to, to get inside the 20% range uh, against uh, trying to, you know, win a demographic group like Latino vote, that's a really low percentage. You know, there was a public poll that said Republicans had 0% of the black vote. That's ridiculous. I mean, there's many blacks that are... That's at least 3%. <laughs> That's at least 3%. But, you know, many blacks are, terrible. you know, pro-life, pro uh, not in favor of higher taxes, want strong law enforcement. So th there's a huge marketing problem. Right. And just one last point is, the, you know, Republicans are also up against a public school system that's not favorable to them, a college system, graduate system, PhD system that's not uh, favorable to them, a media which is not favorable favorable to them. Uh, uh, other than Fox <laughs> News. Uh, a democratic you know, they, audience they, they have, they have some, <laughs> You know, uh, it's, it's not a conspiracy. So, it's not a conspiracy. A young, a young person. 
Yeah. Is there a question? We've got, uh, yes, we've got there is. Ask a yes, question, there is. please. Right. A, young, a young person does not go and become an actor or a musician uh, if they're conservative because those are high-risk endeavors. So my, my question to uh, Vin Weber is, uh, <laughs> or anyone else, uh, how does the Republican Party uh, do a better job of uh, winning the votes of uh, non-Caucasian males? And conversely, how does the Democratic Party do a better job of uh, expanding their base as well? Okay, and we'll combine that with a question over here. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Maman Sidiqou. I'm the ambassador of Niger Republic to the U.S. Uh, in Austin, Texas, in Tallahassee, Florida, where I went to school, my best years have been with bipartisan groups. And I really thank NDI for giving us this floor. Yeah. My question is this. Don't we have any consensus in the USA between the two parties on terrorism? I hear a lot of discussion about drones, not drones, et cetera. What's your, what's your take on that? Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna summarize the questions as what sort of outreach, especially do Republicans have to do to, to minority and non-white voters, and what about a bipartisan consensus on terrorism? No, let's, we, we're, we're running the time, so we're gonna to try run. these two and see what we're, we can we're do. We're already... Uh, I, contri I contribute the most diversity on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is funny. I do think it's funny, and I didn't put the panel together. <clears throat> Let's address, do you want to take the first question on? Uh, for, uh, on how do Republicans outreach to, to it's, it's a bigger topic than we can discuss here in a few minutes. It's clearly a problem. Uh, as you saw from the uh, Republican convention, we have some significant Hispanic leaders. Unfortunately, we don't have many significant Hispanic followers, or at least not enough of them. Uh, and <laughs> if we're down to 27% of the Hispanic vote, according to the last poll, I saw that as a huge, huge problem. Uh, I believe that there are, within both the African American community and the Hispanic community, significant numbers of what I would broadly define as conservative voters, perhaps even a majority in the Hispanic community. But there are a couple of uh, uh, things that have, that have made it very difficult for Republicans to appeal there. Within the African American community specifically, way, going way back, Barry Goldwater's opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, six sticks in the historical consciousness of that community, understandably, and makes it very difficult for us to appeal to even to people that may, disagree, that may agree with us on economic issues or social issues. In the Hispanic community, the danger is that immigration is becoming very much the same thing. It's nice that you agree with me on taxes and abortion and things like that, but unfortunately, I get the feeling you wish I weren't, weren't in this country. That's a, a hard problem to overcome. Uh, it's, but it's one that they're going to have to deal with, uh, I think, rather aggressively going forward and, and, and not target those communities in a token way, but target them in a serious way, try to actually build organization, recruit people, talk about policies that, that matter in those communities, and, it, and, and if they don't succeed, the Democrats are going to be the dominant party for a long time. And is there a consensus on terrorism? Have we moved in some ways together, Obama administration, the continuation of the Bush administration? I think actual? generally there's a consensus on terrorism. I, obviously, this is one of those areas where there, it invites greater unity when we're under threat, and we view terrorism as a, a very threatening uh, possibility uh, constantly ever since 9-11. And it has, by and large, united us. I think there is, uh, the questioner asked about drones. I think there's growing sensitivity about the proper use of drones. And, and how they ought to be employed as we go forward. There's even some consensus on that. But in this very polarized political existence, I think it's the one area where, at least for now, there's uh, a reasonable possibility that growing consensus could be achieved. Let me just uh, leave you with, uh, with one thought, uh, which is a second-term president often has trouble with his own base. They're disappointed invariably in a first term. They don't get what they want. Uh, they think that in a second term he's free from that re-election possibility and things can be better. There's probably been no area of greater disappointment in the Democratic base than Obama's aggressive approach towards terrorism, uh, keeping Guantanamo open, uh, the use of detentions in different ways, the aggressive response out there. And I think it would be a challenge for him uh, because you're going to get a base, I think, that will grow more vocal if he's in a second term 
uh, asking him to pull back, and it doesn't seem to me he's likely to do that. Uh, he's yeah. invested deeply in that. So we've got a lot of issues, uh, a lot of challenges in a very difficult political environment, whether uh, Romney wins and whether it's a Democratic uh, Senate or an all-Republican Congress, I could argue it would be more difficult for him with an all-Republican uh, Congress. And uh, for a President Obama, where he'll have Republicans who know they'll have to deal with him for another four years, but a lot of people coming in who may not want to do that, even if that's the reality. And that's what we all face as we face this choice with rather different candidates. Uh, we want to, again, thank Amgen and NDI for uh, 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 hosting this entire uh, forum and uh, uh, on behalf of uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, and the American Enterprise Institute, uh, please a round of applause for these great panelists. <laughs>